This program is exclusively sponsored by Deborah Day in memory of Theodore J. Day. Tahoe is surely not one, but many. As I curve around its heads and bays and look far out on its level sky, I am reminded of all the mountain lakes I ever knew, as if this were a kind of water heaven to which they had all come. John Muir, 1873. Lake Tahoe is one of the most remarkable scenic climaxes in the world because it's a huge, phenomenally clear alpine lake. It's 22 miles long, 12 miles wide, more than 1,600 feet deep. If you emptied it out, it would cover France or Texas and a foot of water. A few bodies of water are as strategically placed as Lake Tahoe. It is right directly in the path of American migration to the Pacific coast. It's not only one of those landscapes that begged uh, uh, definition, it helped Americans to define where they were. Many books and exhibitions at museums have been devoted to some of America's most scenic and iconic landscapes. And for that reason, it's very easy to conjure a mental image of places like Niagara Falls or the Grand Canyon, or even Yosemite and Yellowstone. But the same cannot be said for Lake Tahoe, even though hundreds of artists have made work about the region of Lake Tahoe and Donner over the past 200 years. The washer referred to Lake Tahoe as Dao Aga. When they went there, they blessed themselves in the water because it fed, it fed the people, the animals, and the plants. It was very important. The washer people were hunters and gatherers who were part of the Great Basin. We all made our annual journey to Lake Tahoe to, to catch the early runs of the whitefish, and later on in the summer, the trout runs. Basketry was integral to Washoe daily life. Baskets and woven items made with natural fibers were used in many ways, such as for food gathering, processing, preparation, and storage. Some baskets were specifically designed to carry burden, whether food, water, or children. Washoe people rarely fished in Lake Tahoe, but rather in the tributaries and small streams where fish could be caught with woven baskets or nets. Washoe weavers carefully tended the plants they needed for weaving so that they would produce quality fibers, and in doing so, they developed a special relationship with the natural environment. The arrival of European Americans at Lake Tahoe in the mid-19th century would forever change the traditional Washoe way of life. The grass seeds, the plant food that was destroyed, the pine nut trees were cut down. We weren't allowed to fish anymore. We were chased away from Tahoe, but our tribalness kept us together. We, we sustained our way of life and our l language despite all that. There's a big question about the Far West, and you can see it in the early maps from the 1820s and 30s with the Great American Desert, the undefined regions. Not only what is uh, the Far West, but where are we when we are there? What metaphors do we use? How do we understand it? How do we understand it scientifically? How do we appropriate it imaginatively? John C. Fremont, a second lieutenant in the U.S. Army Corps of Topographical Engineers, is considered the first Euro-American to view Lake Tahoe on February 14, 1844. So when John C. Fremont, as an Army explorer, is crossing the Sierra Nevada, um, he does so with his cartographer Charles Proust and the rest of his party near what we now call Carson Pass. And as they're crossing the pass uh, in the middle of winter in the deep snow, they climb one of the peaks to see where they are, and they espy in the distance to the north this great body of water uh, that we now call Lake Tahoe. Because they weren't actually standing on the shore, because it was just a newly discovered geographical feature, Proust picks a relatively anonymous name. He's simply in his journals, and Fremont in his journals refer to it as Mountain Lake. It was the practice of the U.S. Army for many expeditionary forces around the world to take artists with them as they traveled so that you could get to know the place. That's true at Lake Tahoe. So you see all of these representations by people who are beginning to travel through, first with the Army people and then with these amateur artists crossing the Sierra to get to California. You find all of these beautiful landscape images of the lake. By the 1850s, the lake was commonly referred to as Lake Bigler, named for the popular third governor of California, John Bigler. The name Tahoe, based on a native Washoe word, was first used around 1862 and then used interchangeably with the name Bigler for many years. The earliest photographs of Lake Tahoe were actually published by a firm out of San Francisco known as Lawrence and Howsworth. They hired Charles Leander Weed sometime between the years 1862 and 1864. 
En route to Virginia City, Weed traveled on the Placerville stage route, what we now know as Highway 50. And upon reaching the summit, which was then known as Johnson's Pass, he looked down upon what at the time was called Lake Valley. He stopped for a short time with his photographic wagon and a team who were traveling with him, set up his camera, and then photographed what we now know as the Lake Tahoe Basin. His view is comprised of two photographs, which when seen side by side, create what is considered the first panorama of Lake Tahoe. Beginning in the decade of the 1860s, the route to Lake Tahoe and the lake itself became a subject for professional artists who depicted scenes with an enhanced sense of realism known as the Hudson River School style. Hudson River School painters painted real American scenes, topographically accurate American scenes. There was a nationalistic element behind it. Before the acquisition of the uh, western third of the country, America had no scenery that could compare with the Alps and the Pyrenees of Europe. And suddenly, scenic parity was achieved with the Rockies and the Sierra, and especially Yosemite and Lake Tahoe, which were the most beautiful places on the American continent. And so, in an era where painters were painting realistic scenes of American views, many painters gravitated to the West to capture the beauty of these newly discovered for the Euro-American scenes. Paintings had to be realistic, but also in the 19th century, nature was seen as God's handiwork. Therefore, you had to show nature as having a transcendental implication, that uh, it wasn't just, you weren't just doing a photograph, but you were probing nature for clues to its divine origins. So the artist was presented with two contradictory demands. One was get it right, the other was make it better than right. In 1873, painters Thomas Hill, William Marple, and Hiram Reynolds Bloomer traveled together to Lake Tahoe on a sketching and painting trip. Emerald Bay was painted in Thomas Hill's San Francisco studio following his visit, perhaps explaining why he added a waterfall to the landscape that doesn't actually exist. Hiram Reynolds Bloomer's painting of Emerald Bay offers a different perspective, showing Finette Island from the shore. A lean-to in campfires suggest the artist may have camped there overnight. Another painting by Thomas Hill shows a man leaning against a boulder near the lake's edge. It is probably the legendary hermit of Emerald Bay, Captain Dick Barter, who drowned when his boat capsized in 1873. One of Barter's oars emerged from the water months later, but his body was never found. Hill painted the oar along with a dead tree as symbols of this tragedy. The third artist in the traveling trio was William Marple, who was inspired by the French Barbizon style of painting that emphasized a moody and tonal color palette and softened landscape forms. Marple believed the approach was more up to date than the Hudson River School style favored by many American painters. The Sierra Nevada range was a physical and symbolic obstacle to America's westward expansion in the 19th century. The legendary struggles of the Donner Party in the winter of 1847, along with America's enterprising drive to surmount Donner Summit via railroad, fueled a young nation's manifest destiny to stretch its boundaries from coast to coast. Due to this, artists depicted Donner Lake and the activities unfolding along Donner Pass with increasing frequency. The photographic activity that transpired in the Sierra in the 19th century is really inextricably linked to the expansion of the Transcontinental Railroad. And that is because many of the railroad executives hired photographers to document and to celebrate what was taking place over Donner Pass and along the Sierra route. Many of the railroad executives had an interest in art. In fact, everyone from Crocker to Huntington to Stanford had a photographer for which they advocated. In the case of Alfred Hart, for example, who was hired initially as the official railroad photographer for the Central Pacific, he was strongly supported by, the, by Edwin B. Crocker, the brother of Charles Crocker. Carlton Watkins was a longtime friend of Collis Huntington, and when Hart was no longer working for the railroad, Watkins took on many of the commissions to document the transcontinental line. In the case of Edward Moybridge, Leland Stanford was a longtime fan. Whether photographing for a railroad company or a commercial firm or a government survey, the photographers really framed their images with an eye towards pleasing their clients. It was not only photographers who were influenced by patrons of the railroad industry. Painters Albert Bierstadt and Thomas Hill were both drawn to Donner Summit in the 1870s because of lucrative commissions provided by railroad executives. Bierstadt whose popularity was fading in the East, 
came out to California in search of new patrons, and he found one in the railroad baron Collis Huntington, who commissioned Bierstadt to paint Donner Lake. And uh, Bierstadt and, and Huntington went out there in, uh, in 1871, where Bierstadt took some studies, and he returned in 1872 and took some more studies and ended up painting a huge painting of Donner Lake from the summit, looking east at, at sunrise, at sunrise betokening the dawn of a new era in America caused by the uh, construction of the railroad. When Bierstadt turned his attention in his studio to his six by 10 foot exhibition painting of Donner Lake, he applied a variety of artistic exaggerations upon which he often relied. For example, the dark color palette Bierstadt used was a melodramatic device that some critics argued went too far. Huntington was disappointed because the railroad snowsheds and the old Donner Pass wagon road were placed so far in the distance that they were hardly visible. Bierstadt probably considered them too mundane to include in what he hoped would be perceived as a sublime and panoramic celebration of God's natural creation. Nevertheless, when Donner Lake from the summit was unveiled in San Francisco in 1873, it was hailed as a masterpiece by the public and several critics. And that led Leland Stanford, who was Collis Huntington's business partner, but his antagonist as an art collector, to commission Thomas Hill, who was a resident San Francisco landscape painter, to do a six by 10 foot version. And Hill executed such, uh, such a painting that also had the snow sheds way in the distance, but it was perfectly uh, um, pleasing to Governor Stanford. Unfortunately, only this study for Hill's painting survives. Hill's six by 10 foot canvas was lost when Stanford's Knob Hill Mansion was destroyed by the fire following the 1906 San Francisco earthquake. As far as Donner Pass is concerned, there's been so much writing about the utopian aspects of California. California promises a better life. People are coming in the uh, mid 19th century for a better life, the gold rush. But there are also dystopian possibilities. During the construction of the transcontinental line in the Sierra, over 18,000 Chinese laborers were employed. The conditions under which they worked were dangerous and perilous, and nearly 1,200 of them lost their lives in the Sierra. Many artists today choose to revisit this history in an effort to honor and memorialize those lives that were lost. A contemporary artist like Mian Situ places Chinese laborers at the center of his canvas. They become heroic workers, honored finally for their great contributions to the construction of the railroad in the American West. Hung Lu has created a large-scale installation that also honors the work of Chinese laborers. Her installation features more than 200,000 fortune cookies situated in a large mountain that she refers to as Gold Mountain that buries two railroad tracks. In many ways, this installation can be read as a memorial or a grave for the thousands of Chinese workers who lost their lives in the Sierra. Despite the harsh realities of progress associated with the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad, its completion in 1869 ushered in a renewed era of growth and business enterprise for the Lake Tahoe region. And with improved rail travel, Lake Tahoe became a destination that welcomed business people as well as early tourists. Almost from the moment that people began settling in Nevada, architecture was a part of the conversation. And the earliest structures that were created were industrial structures for mining and timber resources. Those structures, though, almost instantly were superseded by uh, the, the structures that were used for the tourist, the rise of the tourist trade. And on almost every shore, there were incredible lodges built in Tahoe City, Glenbrook, South Lake, elsewhere around the lake. New hotel and lodge construction, as well as Nevada's nearby underground silver mines, were dependent on Tahoe timber. When John Muir visited Tahoe for the second time in 1888, he was deeply distressed by what he saw. Hillsides once covered in trees were barren. Photographer Carlton Watkins was commissioned to photograph the operations of the Carson and Tahoe Lumber and Fluming Company. Watkins' photograph shows the company's Glenbrook headquarters framed by fallen trees in 1876. 
it is estimated that 300,000 board feet of Tahoe timber was removed from the basin daily, destined for the underground mines of the Comstock. The developing economy and enhanced growth of the region did not only place stress on the Tahoe Basin's timber reserves, the lake's seemingly endless water supply was soon to become a controversial resource as well. By the end of the 19th century, the water that flows out of Lake Tahoe is now being used to water the nascent community of, of Reno and Sparks, but it's also, uh, it's passage out to Pyramid Lake, it's being looked at as a resource to turn the desert into a garden. And an early senator, uh, Francis Newlands from Reno, buys up a bunch of desert land in anticipation of the fact that using his position in Congress, he can get the Bureau, new, newly established Bureau of Reclamation to build a canal to divert some of the water from Lake Tahoe and the Truckee River out to Fallon. And um, he does that. And in so doing, in taking that water away from the Truckee River, they begin to lower precipitously the lake level at Pyramid, and they actually dry up an intermittent overflow lake called uh, Winnemucca Lake that's just off to the northeast of Pyramid. You can see how important Lake Tahoe is in terms of its hydrology and its watershed when you look at works by people like Maya Lin, who is one of the world's most acclaimed art living artists. Um, Maya's done a beautiful piece that traces all of the waters flowing into the lake. She's done this pin drawing uh, where she takes thousands of pins and basically maps out um, in a contemporary sense all of the water that flows into Lake Tahoe. So it's, she's relying on, on 19th and 18th century mapping conventions to define the lake by the water that flows into it and using an art piece to do that. By the end of the 19th century, John Muir recognized that Lake Tahoe was increasingly burdened by demands placed upon its resources. Although he worked to have it declared a national park, his efforts fell short when he couldn't rally enough votes in Congress. Eventually, much of the property surrounding Lake Tahoe was privatized, and by the turn of the century, the lake had been discovered as a place of recreation and leisure. Walter Danforth Bliss's 1901 design for the Tahoe Tavern ushered in an era of architecture in the built environment of the Lake Tahoe Basin that hadn't existed before. It became the most lavish and the most uh, well-regarded hotel accommodations in the basin. Visitors to the Tahoe Tavern and other resorts around the lake brought with them an air of urban sophistication and changed the culture at Tahoe. The new influx of tourists also impacted the Washoe people of the region. Most notably, a burgeoning culture of consumerism helped spur a new market for Native American curio items, especially Washoe basketry. Very early on, uh, even going back to the mission period, foreigners were very much taken by the beauty, the quality, uh, the varied uses of baskets by Native people. In Nevada and the area around Lake Tahoe, businessman Abe Cohn and his wife Amy were instrumental in creating a market for Washoe basketry that extended well beyond the region. Louisa Kaiser, known to the world as Datsolali, became one of the most noted Washoe weavers they represented. In the case of Louisa Kaiser and the other great weavers like Cease Bryant, Maggie James, Sarah Mayo, Lena Dick, Abe and Amy Cohen had the Emporium store in Carson City, which was originally a dry goods store. Amy asked Abe if they should put some baskets, some local Washoe and Paiute baskets in the store. Pretty soon, Abe realizes that he's making more money selling the baskets than the dry goods. And there are certain kinds of baskets that become more popular than others. And uh, I think the weavers were very savvy in figuring out what the customer wanted. They also opened up a shop at Lake Tahoe, which Amy runs in the summer to be there for all the tourism that's coming. So while Louisa was there at Tahoe City, she would weave. And there are some very, very interesting pieces of journalism from uh, travel writers coming all the way up from Los Angeles. And one of them, he's talking about the wonders of the lake and the mountains and that. And at the very end, he says, however, a must see is Dot Salali. You must go see this woman work. In the early 20th century, the ease of automobile and rail travel contributed to Lake Tahoe's reputation as a destination for artists and architects, like San Francisco-based painter Lorenzo Latimer. In 1914, Latimer accepted the invitation of William Price to spend the summer at Fallen Leaf Lake, where Price owned the lodge there. And he, as always, brought um, his students along with him in order 